Cycling involves many different biomechanical movement factors, including torque, angular force, mechanical work, power, energy, and collisions. Let's explore these concepts further. Torque can be defined as the extent of force applied to an object that causes rotation. This force is considered the moment of angular force, which describes the application of force at a specific distance from a pivot point. In cycling, this pivot point is the crank. During cycling, this rotation can be seen when the legs pedal in a circle by way of the pivot point on the crank. As long as the legs continue to apply force on the pedals through muscular contractions and rotation, the bike will be propelled forward with help of torque. There are several factors that can affect torque and force, which may include muscular strength, torso angle, and saddle height. More experienced cyclists usually like to bike with a cadence of 80 to 110 rotations per minute. Therefore, when torque is applied through force on the pedals, the stronger an individual is, the faster and further they can travel by using a harder gear and a sufficient cadence to produce torque. When torso angle is changed, it has also been shown to affect muscular activation. As torso angle is decreased to allow riders to become more aerodynamic, a significant increase in crank torque occurs due to different muscle activation patterns. Saddle height is also important to consider when understanding the amount of force that can be created by torque. When a seat is positioned too low, the moment arm and force are located closer to the center of rotation, decreasing the amount of force that can be generated. As a result, the leg will not have to move as far or as fast, which decreases both momentum and force applied to the pedal. Common errors seen in cycling include incorrect seat height, incorrect pedaling cadence, and inefficient pedaling mechanics. These can be corrected by performing a bike fitting that allows for proper seat height which will increase force and allow for pedaling efficiency within a single plane. In addition, instruction should be given that encourages the rider to pedal faster on an easier gear to increase cadence. Finally, instructions on pedaling efficiency would help to streamline leg movements and decrease extra movements in unnecessary planes. During cycling, mechanical work is equal to the average force that is applied to the pedal, multiplied by the distance over which it is applied. We can identify two opposite forces, the downward slope and the upper trajectory of the shafts as they revolve around the axis of rotation at the cranks. The kinematics of the lower body joints and skeletal muscles provide the source for the mechanical work. Thus, the greater work done, the better the performance. The joints of the ankle, knee, and hip contribute to the total joint mechanical work. During fatigue, reduced pedaling cadence is related to a reduced contribution of the ankle joint. Conversely, hip and knee joints serve as power sources during cycling movements. For pedaling cadences ranging from 60 to 100 RPMs, we see a higher contribution of mechanical work from the knee and reduction from the hip. In trained cyclists at higher cadences, the effectiveness of the pedal force application during propulsion of the crank cycle seems to improve. Consequently, a higher pedaling cadence would decrease hip and increase knee joint contributions to the total mechanical work of the lower body kinetic system as joint forces decrease and cadence increases. The ability to produce high power during a brief period is critical to success. There are two variables influencing optimum power, body mass and saddle position. Because there is an inverse relationship between mass and acceleration, an increased body mass will impair performance. Higher body mass increases the energy demand of the cyclist to overcome vertical displacement and drag. Furthermore, when properly fitted, the saddle positions, joint kinematics, and the corresponding tissues of the lower limbs all play interdependent roles. The ankle joint is more affected by the manipulation of the mechanics of cycling compared to the hip and knee joints. The control of the plantar flexor muscle's length has been suggested as an attempt to maximize muscle power production through ankle rigidity, enhancing the force transfer from shank to crank. A reduced knee range of motion results in higher cadences, which is associated with angular velocity. Similarly, the muscles of the knee and hip have articulations at both joints, inspiring a shift in demand in higher cadences. The knee will at times assume more responsibility in mechanical work than that of the hip in higher cadences where the saddle is appropriately fitted. Consequently, the knee along with the hip is the joint with the greatest relative contribution to the total net moment, thereby impacting power output. A cyclist uses mechanical energy to create the circular pedaling motion to propel them forward. Using their lower extremity to generate appropriate energy expenditure puts the bike in motion, creating kinetic energy. In order to keep this kinetic energy, and in order to obtain a constant speed propulsion, extra energy is necessary. This energy can come from the form of chemical energy from within the body. 
produced from nutritional foods consumed, the chemical energy is then converted to kinetic energy when muscle fibers contract during movement. The muscle fibers within the lower extremity contract to push the pedals of the bike creating forward movement. Once the cyclist is in motion, their pedaling momentum will keep them moving, unless an external force influences the movement. This helps explain the principle of conservation of angular momentum, which can be the rotary equivalent of Newton's first law of inertia, stating that a mass on the move wants to continue to move in absence of an oppositional force. Unfortunately, unless the cyclist manually stops the bike, another way of stopping the angular momentum of the bike is a collision. This either occurs if a cyclist is not paying attention where they are riding and runs into a stationary object, they are struck with a car that is running across traffic, or even overtaken by a car traveling in the same direction. Fatigue can be a major error in regards to the cyclist's energy and risk of collision. Once fatigue sets in during high intensity cycling, peripheral fatigue makes it more difficult for the cyclist to keep their momentum moving forward. When fatigue takes over, the cyclist runs the risk of either falling over from lack of momentum or not having the reflexes to get out of the way of an object, leading to a collision. If the cyclist is becoming fatigued, they should get off and walk the bike or stop to take a break before they continue their destination. Precautions can be taken for the cyclist to prevent collisions, specifically with motor vehicles. A safety helmet can reduce the risk of significant head injury or fatality in the case of a collision. Additionally, the use of lights and high visibility clothing, reflective or fluorescent, will make the cyclist more visible to drivers. The best way to prevent collisions between cyclists and motor vehicles for busy traffic areas is to create bicycle infrastructures with physical separation between the cyclists and the large vehicles such as trucks and buses. Bicycle infrastructure can also provide security to individuals who would like to ride their bike but are too afraid of potential collisions, thus increasing the population's physical activity.